Hello Eco2000 students, Dr. Conway here. Just checking in, making sure that everybody received their um, midterm exam questions. As you'll notice, there's three. None of them is particularly complicated from the point of view of uh, uh, the lessons that we've received in the term thus far. Uh, in fact, I put the lesson numbers beside each of the questions um, so that you can you can focus, except for the last one where I'm I'm asking you to be more sort of collective in your thinking, okay? Um, the descriptive uh, question, um, what is it, what's different about environmental economics? Uh, I think we went through that quite uh, comprehensively. Uh, remember that you're, you're talking about describing some of the key concepts uh, that differ between um, neoclassical and welfare economics and political economy and environmental economics. And uh, why, why, is, why have those concepts been changed? What's driving environmental economics over the other schools of economics? Um, and so you can cover that off with uh, lessons one and two. The analytical question, explain the main features of different economic analysis approaches. That was lesson three. And remember the, the, the key concepts there on monetization and how each method uh, treats monetization as opposed to quantification. And so on, and that those are the key, uh, the key. That's the key line to follow in that answer. The scenario question. That's a more sort of um, uh, all-encompassing question. Uh, it it speaks really to what you're doing in your term projects, your design group projects. Um, <clears throat> and so I want you to give me a sense as to the 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 criteria, the factors that you would be looking at. Remember the concept of factors, the concept of variables the concept of baseline, the concept of scope, those key kind of concepts, okay? If you cover those off in, this, in that answer, I think you'll be fine, all right? Now remember, 350 words, uh, maximum length, but those have to be very polished words. There's only 350 for each answer, but they, they have to be quite polished. So spend time making sure that you get everything you need into those 350 words per answer and that it's well written, that the paragraphs are short, the sentences are short and punchy, the reader does not need to go looking through your paragraphs to try to find out the main points you're trying to make. Each paragraph is its own main point, okay? And each sentence is, is fleshing out that point in a short, tight sentence, okay? Use Grammarly, use Grammarly Premium to do your writing because the, the grading will be significantly influenced by the quality of your presentation. And that's because when you're out there in the marketplace, your quality of the, your presentation is going to be the difference between uh, whether you win contracts, win jobs, uh, or not. In other words, meet up, food on the table, okay? So really practice on your writing skills as much as you can, all right? Uh, because of the Thanksgiving break, we missed uh, one lecture, which I want to go over very quickly because we won't have time when I return. Uh, when we return to class, because we'll start to focus on the other subject matters and uh, start to really talk up your, your group designs and get those uh, focused and on the rails. Because once we return from week eight break, uh, there's not that much time left to do a good job and we still have to go through a more detail on cost-benefit analysis and budgeting and things like that, okay? So this week's lecture was to be techniques for gathering, uh, for data gathering in environmental economics. Um, many of the techniques would be, would be applied to any form of research, uh, but uh, including research in the design field, uh, but uh, we were putting an emphasis, a little bit of emphasis on it, uh, the environmental economics side. Um, <clears throat> There's really the two, two major uh, uh, data sources out there, data sources gathered by others and self-generated data sources. Uh, most of the time, most of the time, you'll be using uh, uh, data sources gathered by others. But in some cases, you're doing survey research, you're doing other types of research to, to, uh, to self-generate data, okay? Um, there's various types of data sets you can look at, and this applies to your group design projects too. Uh, privately held data sets. There are numerous, um, as I've said before, there are numerous companies and nonprofit organizations that have as one of their major focuses to collect data either for commercial uses or to advance objectives of like-minded citizens. These data sets can be very large. They may be they may be very small and specialized. 
but the point is is that there are uh, substantial data sets that can be used to um, uh, to to flesh out a concept, to explore an idea, a design concept, whatever the case may be. Uh, then there's also uh, big data. Uh, these are privately held data sets, but of different kind. They're, they're the large data sets where you can do research on uh, people's opinions and more importantly, people's uh, purchasing and viewing behavior uh, within these big data sets. Those would be Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Snapchat, etc., where you can you can um, get you know uh, data from these data sets to explore um, uh, major sort of trends in the market, for example, or maybe beliefs that maybe major belief systems that are out there in the marketplace that may uh, influence future designs. Typically, these are these sort of large data sets are accessed by people who. Um, who are uh, larger budgets that can can spend the time that's required to explore such large data sets okay and uh, but if you can of course you can get millions and millions and millions of data points or observations as opposed to what you could do with uh, with the smaller more small uh, privately held data sets that may be focusing on life cycle assessment or might be focusing on design concept concepts like house for example and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, these data sets become invaluable uh, as, as you work on larger projects uh, for, for areas and so on. For example, if you were exploring a particular large building complex or housing project or whatever, uh, these are the types of trends, uh, b both in privately held data sets and big, big data data sets that you would want to develop some expertise. But if you're working for a large firm, there will be people in there that will have that expertise. Okay. <clears throat> then you have primary research, uh, which is also data generated by others. These are typically unpublished research efforts undertaken in academia. Companies are nonprofit, non-government organizations to assemble data and analyses for specialized purposes. Um, you can you can typically uh, find these in in sort of uh, uh, these would be the types of things that would be conference papers, conference presentations, um, uh, analyses done within firms that that people are willing to share with you. These are primary research that are not published as secondary research. Um, in your current projects, you will probably depend a lot on the fourth category, which is. Secondary research, these are published, uh, traditionally published and peer-reviewed documents uh, that would be talking about, uh, let's say, lead and, and the recent data on lead differential costs vis-a-vis -a, -vis a standard build and all these kinds of secondary research magazines, uh, these types of things. And that's where you'll spend a lion's share of your time in your, your term projects or your design group projects. Okay. Um, Self-generated data sources are, tip, are, are quite broad-based and, and they're used a lot in the industry, in the design industry, okay? These would be everything from, from surveys, uh, trying to identify people's uh, preferences or emerging preferences, um, observational data where you're, you're observing how people react to, uh, say, entering a large, bu large building. How does the traffic flow um, and these kinds of things, okay? Um, this would be, you know, the example of somebody sitting on a chair in, in the, at the main door of a mall and collecting data and checking off boxes. Okay, this person went here, did this, whatever. Um, and so these kinds of things might be used for sort of mapping traffic flows, uh, uh, productivity standards, um, these kinds of observational things. And, and you can observe almost every kind of, uh, of a human interaction out in the physical world. So the, the scope for this is, is really quite, quite substantial. Survey instruments, same thing. You can survey on pretty much any number of things to, to, uh, to uh, generate data. That those, those data points can be, uh, can be sort of pure opinion or they be, can be trying to correct, uh, collect uh, factual information on subjects, okay? Uh, but the point is, is that there's all kinds of different survey design, in, uh, survey instruments, the ways to design questionnaires. We call them survey instruments. Uh, we, there's also all kinds of ways to conduct surveys, random and non-random uh, surveys, um, and each of them having different, uh, 
different reliability, statistical probability um, uh, characteristics. Okay. Um, finally, there's focus groups. The focus groups are really a prominent uh, activity when you're trying to gauge people's opinions and you're trying to gauge trends in a major population group or subpopulation. For example, running a focus group with younger people who are going to be buying uh, bachelor style condominiums uh, or one bedroom condominiums. Uh, the focus groups of elderly people that, that uh, want to, uh, you want to gauge that you're keeping up with the design of uh, a seniors residences. Uh, any number of different things. Detailed focus groups are used heavily in politics. They're used heavily in design work. They're used heavily in sort of uh, any major product design like automobiles, uh, things like that. Focus groups is a very uh, effective technique for digging more deeply into the, uh, the views of a, of a target audience, okay? Um, and then when you're collecting data, of course, I mean, you cannot necessarily count on the reliability of the data each and every instance. You have to confirm data reliability. And uh, so what I do is I provide in slide seven for this week, um, I begin to provide some of the things that you need to look at to make sure that the data quality is there, that there's no irrelevant or duplicated data, there's, that all data is pertinent and there's no pertinent data omitted. Um, there's no extraneous data, misinterpreted data collected. And the, all these can happen when you're dealing with institutions, you're dealing with, with fact finding in any primary data source, there, particularly if it's data that's collected on an ongoing basis and then somebody sits at a desk and data inputs it, there's lots of uh, opportunity for data error and things like that. But most of the data sets you'll be working with will be data sets that, uh, that, that are, have already been vetted or published, particularly if you go for uh, data sets in, in, uh, in uh, government published data. That data has been vetted uh, over and over again, probably by three or four different departments. So if you're looking at housing data from uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing, if you're looking at data from Statistics Canada, from Transport Canada in terms of traffic flows in neighborhoods, things like that, that data will have been vetted uh, heavily. If you go to uh, less formalized data sources, or if you go to, um, if you're collecting data that is primary data from, let's say, um, a construction company and, and, or, or something like that that has not been vetted, vetted or peer reviewed, then data quality, determining data quality is an important uh, aspect, okay? Um, so uh, you have to be aware of these things. There's, there can be all kinds of problems that arise, conflicting data, language barriers, lack of access to data, insufficient time to collect data, and so on. All of these can influence uh, data collection. So when you start, you, you begin to launch into a project, a major design initiative, make sure that your, the questions you're asking about your design or how far you're taking your design can be answered with appropriate data in a reasonable amount of time and at a reasonable cost. One of the major mistakes that people can make is trying to um, assume that they can collect a lot more data and do a lot more with data than they have the time or budget to do. Okay, so you have to scope your projects in that way as well. All right, in, the, in, a, in addition to the ways we've already talked about in the context of costs and benefits. All right. Uh, <clears throat> And I, I provide you with some steps uh, in slides 9 and 10 for evidence-based design. Um, it, it may seem uh, sort of obvious, but you need to think these through. So when you plan to do any research project to substantiate a new design trend or to substantiate what you think you can get in return for these new design features in the marketplace when people buy condos or they rent, or they, or whatever the purpose, or they have a mall and you want stores to set up in it, or whatever the case may be, you need to follow sort of rigorous steps in your data collection to be able to justify the proposal that you're putting on the table. Okay, so when you do your design group presentations this this term, um, you don't, you know, you can't just float out concepts and say, oh, this would be good. You have to float out concepts and say. This is a very attractive design feature, and in addition to, evidence indicates that. 
uh, that we can get a 15% more return from the market of selling these condo units or these housing units or or these office units or these store uh, these these store fit ups or whatever the case may be. And in order to validate that data, you should follow sort of rigorous steps in collecting the data and presenting the data. And so that's what uh, I talk about in slides nine and 10. You can look at those slides and uh, make sure that you're, you're aware of these for when you do your own group presentations, okay? Um, this was explicitly designed to be a, a relatively shorter lecture because of the need for the video in this week. Uh, but do go over uh, these um, uh, these steps and the, and these issues because they will uh, you'll we, you will see them again uh, in terms of my critiques of your design group proposals and in the final exam. Okay, I know you're doing your midterm this week, uh, but we will not return to this presentation next week. We will go on to the next subject matter. Um, but so do return and make sure that you read the slides and you've made yourself aware. And do try to find some data sets that are available to the public on LCA. Do, do some Google searches on companies that produce LCAs for companies. Um, and, you know, do familiarize yourself if you, already, if you haven't already with major data sources applicable to your field of study like the Canada Mortgage and Housing data, uh, statistical data on... Uh, on, on neighborhoods, statistical data that's collected on, on walking scores and all of these things. Make sure you familiarize yourself before the term is over with all these kind of valuable data sources because they will become your assets uh, later on. And so I don't expect you to be experts in all of them at this point, but uh, at some future date, you will uh, find a need uh, for this kind of data. And I know that some of that's provided in the industry magazines that you for your industry, and so on. But familiarity with the, with the 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 the, the primary data sets, is is going to be extremely important to you, when you graduate. Okay, so do try to understand what it is for data sources. Do understand where the try to understand where the valuable data sources are, where they are free, which is ma mainly the public sector data. Um, uh, and international data uh, and where you can acquire them for a price, data sets for a price, like buying LCA data from private firms and things like that. Because if you work with a company that's big enough, you can, you can, you can afford to get these data sets and that would, they will give you a competitive advantage, particularly in the context of if you're moving towards uh, green design, okay? So good luck with the midterm exam this week, and I'll be seeing you the week after next because, of course, uh, week eight is your break. And uh, so enjoy your break, and then we'll see you back in week nine, okay? And I will almost certainly have your exams graded by then, all right? So uh, good luck. Have a good uh, week uh, of work, final week, and take a good break in week eight, and we'll see you in week nine. Bye-bye now. Take care.